Well, actually, um, thank you very much for having us uh, here. I just want to start off by saying um, there's a great uh, privilege for me to be here with Steve, who uh, has been my friend now for, for, for many years. Um, and I'd like to just share with you, before we start, how we actually came to be, because for me, it kind of says a lot about Steve. Um, I, would you believe, was um, 14 years old and when I first heard of Steve. Um, I was queuing up for a concert for a group called Tetra, who my teacher had told me was the finest quartet in the world. Um, I'd played some of his pieces, um, and I wanted to know who this guy Steve Goss was. Uh, then, I don't know, some 20 years later or something like that, um, having realised that this, this guy has made a massive contribution to the guitar repertoire, I had the opportunity to play in Tetra. Um, and at that point, I realised there was a lot more to Steve, which is what you know, we're going to be you know, talking about today. Steve is the composer, Steve is the academic, in addition to, to Steve as uh, the guitarist. So you know, thanks very much for being here with me. Oh, it's a great pleasure. It's uh, really good to be here. I actually came along two weeks ago just to see what this was all about, this sort of uh, public interview malarkey. Uh, we had a great time, those of you who were here, with uh, Vladimir Jirovsky. So I'm looking forward to tonight. Um, I suspect there are many people in the room who haven't heard a note of my music, so I thought before I start talking, you ought to hear some, um, just so you get a chance to nip out quickly while the going is good. <laughs> um, what I'm going to play for you is a, a short extract from my piano concerto. Um, no guitar involved at all. Uh, this is the end of the, of the slow movement. The piano concerto was recorded in 2013. Uh, the producer on the recording was Andrew Keener, uh, which is how we met. And this piano concerto was written for the French virtuoso um, Emmanuel Despax. Uh, and the orchestra is the Orpheus Symphonia, and the conductor is Thomas Carroll. So this is the very end of the slow movement.
So, so when was that piece written? Uh, that was written in 2013, very recent, a re very recent piece. Because yeah. yeah. to me, I, when I hear your music, I, I, I find it in unmistakably Steve Goss, um, but I also hear a lot of influences, you know, yeah. and it strikes me this is something kind of quite important to your, you know, your musical being. Is that fair to, to say? Absolutely. I mean, um, I don't really write any original music at all. I just simply steal ideas and disguise them a bit. And, um, I really couldn't imagine starting from, from nothing. Um, there's a, an artist I admire greatly called Grayson Perry, and he said more or less the same kind of thing. And that kind of makes me feel comfortable about saying that in public now. <laughs> um, that actually, I, I just do things to music that already exists. And I think in a way that that comes back really from being a guitarist. So many guitarists, we spend so much of our time playing music that wasn't really written for the guitar. Uh, there'll be more of that, that later. Um, but I was very fortunate. I mean, um, I grew up in Wales uh, at a time when there was a very, very good music provision um, in the local council. Uh, I took up the guitar at the age of eight and immediately wanted to compose for it. Uh, the little tunes and ditties I was given to play, I'd sort of do my own versions of them. So I suppose it all really goes back to that. Um, of course, I wanted to be a pop star. I wanted to be on top of the pops. I wanted to play electric guitar. Uh, still do. Want to play it. I don't play it. But, um, but my parents told me that, you know, if I was going to be a musician, I should learn proper, you know, classical technique. Um, so I kind of reluctantly agreed. Then when I moved to secondary school, we had this wonderful situation where the teacher just walked into the room and said, right, who wants to learn the trombone? Who wants to learn the French horn? Who wants to learn the violin? And I don't know why, but I put my hand up for violin. And there's a school instrument, lessons, off you go. And before I knew it, I was kind of wrapped up in that whole youth music thing, where you'd sort of go along to a junior orchestra, then a slightly better orchestra, and then you'd start playing in the county youth orchestra. And so I think it was really uh, that time playing in youth orchestras that gave me my real musical passions, just to be that close to the real stuff. Um, I was going to say, because in terms of the, uh, as a guitarist, you know, we're, we're very used to hearing guitar music written by guitarists at the guitar, and, and your, your music never sounds like it's been kind of forced out of an instrument, but it comes from a kind of wider context, I always think. Do you think that, that childhood influences part of that then? Oh, for sure. And I, I think it's the fact that I, I sort of draw on many different things, not just music, but literature, painting, and so on, and get, kind of get fired up by these things. And because tonight was gear, sort of billed very much as a guitar event, I thought, right, I must find some guitar music that's really influenced me in some meaningful way. And I couldn't find any at all. Um, and in fact, uh, as we'll see later, there's only really one composer whose guitar writing has influenced me, and that's someone who's written very little for guitar. That's Toru Takamitsu, a Japanese composer, and that's probably more to do with his sort of sense of color and his ear and so on. So um, yeah, I feel uh, it's, a, it's a very odd thing because I was very involved in the orchestra and I, I played the violin, I got very serious at the violin. Uh, and at 16, I won a scholarship to a music school, ostensibly to do composition and violin. It was the things I was into. And I had my guitar too. And when I got there, there were all these fantastically good violinists. And I thought, shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I was going to be the next Yehudi Menuhin. And suddenly I sort of, you know, I went from this very small pond into a, a slightly bigger one. And there was a kind of reality check. At which point I thought, actually, guitar is good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I suppose that's, and I'd always been the only guitarist too, so it was always a special thing that was just me. And I'm th sort of thinking back about some of these things, uh, thinking about talking about these early influences tonight, the thing I discovered about myself slightly alarmingly is that I've always liked to be the one who's not like any of the others. Mm -hmm. So that when I was in the orchestra, oh, violin's not my first instrument, I'm a guitarist. Then I went to Welsh Cathedral School. Similarly, I was a composing guitarist who happened to play violin. At that point, I switched to viola, purely to get into better orchestras. It was a very pragmatic uh, switch. This is not a slight on viola players, uh, but certainly in the context I found myself at the time, no one really wanted to play viola. And so, as a result of switching to viola, I got to play in the National Youth Orchestra of Wales, which was a fantastic orchestra. Um, and I just love that whole orchestral experience. Mm. But I still saw myself as a guitarist. Then I went to university to study composition. Mm. 
But again, there were lots of composers there, so I was the only guitarist amongst them. Yeah. Then I went to the Royal Academy to study guitar and composition, mm -hmm. but I was the only composing guitarist, so composition was the thing. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if everywhere I went, I did the thing that I could be best at, mm -hmm. which is really embarrassing. Well, not really. It's but I think it's, uh, I, I really do think that's probably what's happened. So it sounds like, you know, kind of like a, almost like an in, uh, intuitive business decision almost, you know, the, uh, niching, <laughs> niching up, you know, but I mean, but it, it, it always strikes me about what you've done, which is that you've, you've arrived in unusual places by some kind of maybe pragmatic decision like mm. that, and then you've used what you've got when you've got there to th take your journey forward, because I mean, you know, you can't be too self-deprecating, the, the guy won the Julian Breen Prize at the Royal Academy, I mean, these are the best guitarists in the world, get that, so you know, you could, you could play amazingly well, um, but you know, I understand what you're saying about that, that instinct maybe, you mm. know. Um, yeah, and I think it's something that, uh, maybe not as a self-deprecating thing, but I, I don't like a kind of musical education system which has everyone trying to do the same thing. Mm. So it turns into a kind of Olympic sport or something that's similar to, um, well, gymnastics is a classic example, or diving, where everyone has to do exactly the same thing in exactly the same way. Mm. And to some extent, music education has become a little bit like that. Uh, you know, uh, there was a wonderful article in Classical Music which I read just yesterday, because I won't be able to remember the author, but it was brilliant just pointing out the fact that, you know, with the violin in particular, people are so focused on getting everything so perfect that they do it at the expense of everything else. Mm. So there isn't that sort of broad background in creativity, improvising, composing, reading literature, going to art galleries, that kind of if you like the polymath thing we were talking mm -hmm. about before, the sort of sense that in some way you as a musician are expressing all these interests and all these ideas. That's, that's why you play music. Not because music is the thing, but because it's the way you express uh, your view of the world. So I think, um, I think that's kind of at the core of everything. It's this idea that uh, you have to look outside the small narrow thing of the instrument, sure. whether it be the guitar, the violin, or composing. Yeah. Well, it strikes me because one of the first things that I heard from, from you, Steve, in terms of the music you were doing, as I said, was Tetra, mm. um, you know, which is you know, a guitar quartet. And um, Steve is responsible for a large amount of the music which Tetra plays in terms of uh, arranging and, and composing as well. Um, but you know, throughout all of it, there was a significant flavour of the arranger in, in you, wouldn't you say? But yeah, absolutely. I think I'll, I'll probably talk about that. Um, a bit more later, because I'm really interested in, um, in slightly unusual interpretations of things. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it's going back to this, all aiming at the same thing. For me, the idea of urtext is horrible. It's this sort of nasty museum culture thing where you might, you know, go to the Ashmolean or the, uh, or the British Museum and say, oh, look, there's Beethoven's Opus 132 quartet played as it should be on this recording. Um, you know, for me, music is always changing, it's always different. And I kind of love these quirky, unusual performances of things where suddenly you hear a piece that you've known all your life and suddenly, suddenly someone shows you something different about it. Always a huge fan of uh, Glenn Gould's playing, for sure, instance. Sure. And I think my, um, as we're talking about influences, one of my biggest influences early on in my teens and still now is Marlowe. Um, I was very lucky, I was at, uh, just at a comprehensive school in South Wales in Swansea, but I had a very good group, peer group around me. Uh, in, my, in my school, in my little group, um, several people who went on to be, become musicians. One is our, um, Robert Suff, who's a rob, uh, record producer in, in Sweden. And uh, we all used to compose, and we used to get excited about these absurd, com complex new pieces. I remember when Brian Fernio's uh, La Terre in Home came out, which was this enormously complicated orchestral piece. And its sheer complexity gave us, you know, gave us a real sense of excitement. Also, Burt Russell, Earth Dances around that time. And I remember we used to you know, have to do special mail order for big manuscript papers so we could all write for orchestra. And uh, one of the guys came into school one day and said, I found some 45 stave manuscript paper. Can you imagine, 45 staves? So then we all ordered some and all tried to write these massive pieces for improbably large orchestras. <laughs> this is when we were at the age of 13, 14, unbelievably pretentious. <laughs> and uh, we were probably horrible people at the time. <laughs> um, but we, we, had a, we had a lot of fun. Um, and so, yeah, so coming back to Mahler, I'll play, uh, uh, let's have some more music. And this is, this is the opening of Mahler's Ninth Symphony, which is the first movement of Mahler's Ninth Symphony, something I always come back to. It's a kind of piece that got me through my teens, 20s, 30s, and so on. 
And it's something that uh, I listen to sort of regularly, and it never, ever um, ceases to amaze me and never ceases to surprise me. And that, for me, that's what I think good music should be, is that every time you hear it, you think, oh my god, I've never noticed that before. Oh, that's interesting. So here's, here's some Mahler. I'd love to listen to it all, but that, that movement alone is about 29 minutes. <laughs> but you I mean you say about the way this, you know, this influences you and the way you got excited about that music. Mm. I mean, but what is it that, that specifically about Marlowe is that really engaged with you and made you? It's, it's easy to come up with good reasons now because I've thought about it a lot. Mm. I don't know at the time. It just got, I just found it really magical. Mm. Um, I think the reason it's, it's had such a powerful influence is his, his tendency to include different styles and different kinds of music. At a time when music was meant to be sort of pure and about itself and organic, whatever that means, and unified. And he came along and threw in brass band music, folk music, stuff that was really, shouldn't be there in symphonies, apparently. And that kind of slightly um, naughty uh, side to him I've always found fascinating. And the fact you can have music which is about the depths of despair and death one second and about something incredibly trivial the next. And that sort of juxtaposition of the two I always found absolutely fascinating. Do you say that kind of like a character thing? Do you think of yourself as a kind of a, a very sort of, sort of having a, a lot of broad areas that you like to engage with and that's what you connect with him? And Quite yeah. possibly, but I, I think it's that music should have, uh, I mean, that's a very good point. I have to think about that. But I think, you know, music is about character. Mm. I mean, that is the, you know, number of times you go around teaching people and you say, okay, so what do you think the character is here? What's going on? If this was a play, what would this person be doing? Is this a male character, female character? Is it happy, sad? Is something going on? Is there an argument? So there's this kind of dramatic underpinning. Um, so, I mean, I think, I mean, yeah, contrast and character and juxtaposition I find very interesting. Okay. Because, of course, you arranged this for, for the quartet. Well, not this, but you arranged I've arranged Mahler for the quartet. Mahler. Yeah, absolutely, you played Mahler. I mean, you know, if you play the guitar, you've got all these composers missing. Um, and, and you arranged Beethoven. Um, <laughs> yeah, because of the Mahler. <laughs> um, I had an email about that the other day from Ben Verdry, saying he'd no, listened to the Beethoven. Saying he was horrified. No, he wants it. <laughs> he thought it was brilliant. So just for the record, it's the response I get the most about the arrangements I've personally done is people are horrified that I did that. Um, so, <laughs> so this is the Beethoven Piano Sonata, Opus 101. Um, which is a beautiful, fantastic piece. But there are things that you'll hear on the, in the guitar version that you won't hear in the piano version. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> too many. <laughs> but I think, I mean, one of the great things about the whole guitar culture is, is one of arrangement. Um, and I think that's also where a lot of this comes from. It's just I love the idea that there's no kind of real separation between transcription, arrangement, composition, um, Improvisation, these are all sort of things on the same spectrum. So the interpretation really is something that's creative. You're not just simply trying to do what the composer wants, because composers don't really know what they want. Um, and they're often kind of surprised and excited by what people do. So I suppose that's why I've always been drawn to really interesting performers. Um, perhaps we should hear just a little bit of um, Mikhail Pletnev, who is a favorite pianist of mine. Uh, who plays in a quite an idiosyncratic way and not a way that the sort of purists would like the people in, into historical, historically informed performance practice. I'm not being rude about it um, or anything like that and I have a great admiration for it, but I just love it when someone like Pletnev takes a Scarlatti Sonata and makes it sound like Schumann. Um, I actually had the great privilege of working with Pletnev. Um, I wrote a concerto for his Russian National Orchestra a couple of years ago. And uh, it was just extraordinary just to meet him and to shake his hand. And all I could think was, 
oh my God, it's Pletnev. And I had to sort of pretend to be professional and be on the sort of same level, but sort of working with a childhood hero was, was quite something. But it's this kind of playing, both him and Glenn Gould and other pianists, that really captured my imagination. So we'll hear a little bit now of uh, Pletnev playing some Scarlatti, um, K25 Sonata F sharp minor. For me, that's exquisite playing. And also what he does, which is very naughty, he adds notes to certain chords, uh, adds a few sort of sevenths and other sort of romantic little bits and pieces. So he's taking that interpretation sort of one stage further. And I think that kind of lies at the root of all the things I do uh, as a composer. Um, other people do it too. And uh, I was thinking, you know, maybe tonight I should play something by another living composer. Because I suddenly realized that nearly all my sort of influences, all the things I wanted to play, were by people who were dead, basically. Um, there's a lot to play, and a lot of great composers that uh, I admire enormously. Um, but I chose to play you a little bit of Thomas Addis, just because it kind of fitted into what I was talking about tonight, this idea of taking an original piece and doing something to it that transforms it totally. Um, Addis is a, a wonderful composer, a really uh, great mind, very imaginative, fantastic orchestrator. Uh, funnily enough, it's, it's his early works, uh, which from the 1990s. I mean, he was born in uh, 1971 or two. <laughs> um, but his work in the 90s, where he, he, he would take something else and just change it totally. Mm. Um, and there's a piece I want to just uh, play the beginning of called Darkness Visible. And I first heard it in a concert, and I had no idea um, what it was. It was just there, the title was there a long time ago. And it was played, oh, what a beautiful piece, it's fantastic. And at the end, you sort of hear this Dowland coming through to the fore. I thought, oh, there's a Dowland song in there. Perhaps, you know, perhaps it's got some connection uh, with the rest of the piece. Uh, and then I looked at the score and looked at the piece and realized that actually, it was just the Dowland, all the pictures from the Dowland. And what he'd done was just simply change the octaves of things, change the dynamics of things, move things around so that all the pitches and rhythms were Dowland. Everything else was Addis. Mm. And so it got to the point where it was totally exploded or distorted. And that's an idea I stole. <laughs> um, so uh, maybe let's just hear a little bit of this, because this is uh, it's startling. It's just the Dowland. 